Hello there, my fellow armchair warmasters, and welcome back to some 40k lore. Today, as part of our Legion Structure subseries, we're gonna tackle none other than Horus' own boys, the Luna Wolves slash Sons of Horus. I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? First as the Luna Wolves, and later as the Sons of Horus, the 16th Legion maintained much of their structure as it had existed since the Wars of Terra and Solar Unity, which had adhered closely to the Terran pattern laid down in the Principia Bellicosa. The smallest formation within the Logos Terra Militia, and therefore within the Luna Wolves, was the Squad. This consisted of a group of Luna Wolves under the command of a sergeant, Squads varied widely in both size and specialization, with the majority of the units ranging between 10 to 20 Space Marines. Conversely, very specialist squads like reconnaissance units, or those that might have suffered heavy casualties, might consist of just a handful of Space Marines in active service. The specialties and war gear of squads in the Luna Wolves included all of those usually found in other legions including the designated destroyer and seeker units, who were shunned by some and existed in lesser quantities. The Luna Wolves also maintained considerable resources in terms of armor and vehicles, with tithed industrial planets they had brought into compliance and good relations with the Mechanicum, ensuring a steady supply of munitions and materials for the 16th, which spent such political clout readily. Even Horus, usually a generalist and pragmatist, upon being given command of the Legion, is thought to have adopted new squad formations after having seen their effectiveness in other Legions. For example, it is noticeable that until the Lactrical Onslaught, the number of Breacher squads was relatively low in the 16th. The contributions of such units among the forces of the Imperial Fists, for example, couldn't have escaped his notice. After the annihilation of the Lactrical, the number of these squads in the ranks of the Luna Wolves rose noticeably. Other evidence of this adaptability and willingness to embrace new weapons of war can be found in Horus' vocal support of the Tactical Dreadnought Armor Project, with the result being that his legion was one of the first and most widely equipped with Terminator armor and at the forefront of the development of tactics involving it. The 16th showed a preference for the use of tactical squads overall. Squads configured in this manner, both in the Luna Wolves and later in the Sons of Horus, outnumbered all the other squad types combined. Horus remarked on several occasions that there were few challenges of war that couldn't be met by, or did not require, the use of tactical units. The presence of the tactical squads designed to be held in reserve and unleashed once a weakness in the enemy was revealed, the so-called Despoiler Squads, again shows the dominance of the place of the tactical squad in Horus's overall thinking. Such was the effectiveness of this tactic that it was copied by other legions throughout the Great Crusade, such as the White Scars or the Iron Warriors, who fielded their own variants of Despoiler Squads on their own. Moving on, the heart of the Sons of Horus was the Company, which served as the legion's main military division. Made up of several squads under the command of an officer with the rank of captain, the company was the base currency of a campaign or a battle. There was no fixed number for a company within the Legion. While others codified and enforced limits of the size of similar formations, this was not the case among the Sons of Horus, which had begun in more regimented form, but became increasingly ad hoc in structure and disposition over time. Company numbers between 36 and 972 Astartes were recorded, during the 16th Legion's action against the Dasim Patrimony, for example. The configuration of squad types within a company varied as widely as its strength. Some were comprised almost entirely of tactical squads, with a couple of support squads. Others were a great mix, based on the varied requirements of a particular campaign, or the will of Horus. For example, the 17th Company, also known as the Hesperus Guard, had a standard strength of 205 at the time of the virus bombing on Istvan III. Tactical squads made up half of this number. The rest were two veteran units, three reconnaissance units, a heavy support squad, and multiple batteries of support weapons. 
Another example, the Elite First Company, showed even greater variation. Relatively small in number, it contained two distinct formations, the Justerian Terminators and the Catalan Reaver Assault Squads. Both of these had the same black armor worn only by the Elite Company, and each was led by a captain under the overall command of the Legion First Captain, Izika Labadon. Used in combination, the first company exemplified Horus' predilection for precise and overwhelming assaults against strategic targets. In other legions, a company would form part of further layers of hierarchical military organization, variously referred to as battalions, cohorts, chapters, regiments, etc. Horus does seem to have preferred to stick to just the company, without the extra layer of organization. This eroded over time in the Legion, and was mostly academic by the time of their transition to become the Sons of Horus, though. Instead of a more formal structure, Horus would group companies and individual units together, as required for the execution of a particular campaign. The commander of such a formation would usually be a senior captain. If the formation was especially large, then other captains would take on the role of lieutenants to the overall force commander until the completion of the campaign. The formations barely ever had formal titles, but the Sons of Horus did refer commonly to formations intended as fast assaults as spear tips. In abandoning formality and fixed structure above the basic level of the company, Horus demonstrated pragmatism and a preference for waging war with careful precision. Within the 16th, squads also commonly had their own honorific or epithetic titles, rather than simple numerations. The Illuminators Prime, the Deathmakers, Jerox Reavers, the First Sons, and similar appellations, while some were named after sergeants or chieftains that led them, if their leader's own reputation was strong enough. Many of these titles betrayed the culture of the Chthonian gang honors and the tradition of reputation and internecine warfare from which they had come. The culture would grow steadily stronger over the years in the rank and file of the 16th, especially in the intake of neophytes. The exact disposition of the Sons of Horus at the time of the Istvan Free Atrocity is uncertain. Given the accounts of the battle that followed the bombardment from those that survived it, it would seem likely that the cold elements of the 16th approached almost a third of the Legion entire force. Records, tainted as they may be, place the Sons of Horus at a fighting strength of about 130,000 to 170,000 in the period leading up to the Istvan Free Atrocity. Although the number may be higher, the estimate would also tally with the more general assessments of the Sons of Horus Legion being in the upper quarter of strength among the other legions. The fleet of the 16th Legion was also believed to be among the greatest to any single commander's flag with more than a hundred capital warships, and maybe three times that number in smaller cruisers and escorts. Taking into account likely losses from the ground war that followed the virus bombing, and elements of the Legion not in the Istvan system at the time, it would follow that Horus began his heresy with up to 110,000 space marines in his own Legion. Heavily engaged on the surface of Istvan III during the atrocity, it is estimated that about 30,000 Sons of Horus were dead or unaccounted for. It has been theorized by some analysts that as a consequence of the initial difficulties encountered with the purging of the Terrans in the Legion ranks, and the unexpected cost in lives and material in the battle that followed, Horus was deliberately cautious with the use of his soldiers during the Dropside Massacre. In this, it is believed that he hoped to preserve as much of his Legion as possible for the assault on Terra. Or perhaps he simply wanted to have others bloody their own soldiers in his place. As with pretty much all the other legions, Horus's command as a Primarch was absolute. Beneath Horus were the Captains, beneath them were the Squad Sergeants, and where a formation of squads came together with a purpose, the informal rank of Chieftain was given to the Sergeant granted Field Command Authority. This was a matter not always of seniority, but rather selection of the best and most suited authorities for the job at hand. An approach fitting well with the Legion's pragmatic and sometimes impulsive approach to warfare. Beneath these non-commissioned officers were the rank-and-file brothers of the Luna Wolves and later the Sons of Horus. 
This simple hierarchy belied the truth of matters when applied in practice within the 16th though. Within each rank, prestige and personal reputation counted for much among the Brotherhood. There were distinctions between those who fought with the Legion for longer, between those who fought in different campaigns, between those who received different honors, and between certain squads and those who formed the Captain's Honor Guard. Beneath the surface of this simmered other divisions, not easily visible to an outsider, which were divisions of blood and origin. Divisions that the mere act of becoming a space marine should have washed away. But, for the Sons of Horus, it did not in many cases. The hidden divisions would eventually and unfortunately bear bitter fruit. The rank of Captain in the Legion also held subtle variations of authority. Generally those in command of a lower numbered company outranked those in a higher numbered company. While those who once had particular command of a campaign were considered superior to those officers that they had commanded during that action. At the top of this informal but very real hierarchy were the captains who served as Horus's closest advisors, and in particular the first captain of the Legion who commanded the Elite First Company. The senior most captains comprised the famous Mordival, a quartet of Astartes serving as Horus's closest confidants and advisors. Before the outbreak of the Horus Heresy, the Mournival of the Sons of Horus included Garvia Loken, Horus Aximand, Tarek Torgadon, and Ezekiel Abaddon. The Mournival served as an advisory body to Horus both militarily and politically, but in reality, at least on paper, they had no formal power above that of other company captains. Held together by Horus's charisma and brilliance as a commander, the structure of the Luna Wolves and then the Sons of Horus proved to be highly effective, adaptable, and resilient. Combined with their skill in rapidly concluding campaigns, it allowed the Legion to go from victory to victory, forming and reforming to meet every new challenge. Every son of Horus knew his responsibilities and capabilities of those around him, both given by rank and personal repute, capabilities that were enshrined in a hierarchy determined by deeds rather than the demands of a military or ceremonial formality. Effective as this may be, one cannot help but notice the importance of personal prestige and the pack-like sorting of authority as a hallmark of the 16th, and upon occasion the source of some conflict or vendetta within the ranks, a seed of the terrible division to come. As the character of the Legion was an echo of its primarch, so one can see perhaps the flaw of the father in the pride of the sons. So it was that when Horus fell from grace, so too did his sons and their faults, long sleeping, multiplied and consumed them. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to narrate for you on the structure, organization and mindset of the 16th Legion for today. To go on a slight segue here, even like 15 years ago when I was reading the first book in the Horus Heresy, I did find it a bit of a red flag the way the old gang structure of Chthonia was still prevalent in the ranks. Even back then, knowing almost nothing about Warhammer in general, I figured this is not gonna end well. Anyway, as always, I do look forward to your thoughts on the structure of the Sons of Horus in the comments below. Do you approve of it, or do you like other Legion structures better? Let us know. If you found this informative or entertaining, do leave a like, share, subscribe and click the bell icon for future content. Thanks a lot and the Emperor protects.